Greetings all. I've been asked to make a short 15 minute video on the AFVs used in the North Africa campaign. Since the video covering vehicles of the French campaign took about an hour, I'll just cover the vehicles in the story so far, to about April of 1941. Remember, most of the North Africa campaign predates the Tigers and Shermans, which folks normally associate with the fight. And lots of older vehicles are being used instead, which often get forgotten about. We also have about a year's advancement over what we saw in France. So there will be some new appearances, and I'll start out with a new country, Italy. It sometimes seems forgotten that the Italians were the primary contributor to the Axis forces in North Africa, and contrary to popular cultural belief, they were not entirely incompetent. Some units were, others put up a very determined fight. If you will recall from the video on the development of Italian armoured doctrine, the Italians had some very good ideas, but were horribly let down by manufacturing and budgets. With the predominant vehicle being the L3 series, tiny tankettes based on the 1928 Cardin Lloyd, Italian vehicles started out behind the power curve. And unfortunately for the Italians, of the large number of small tanks that they had, not a whole hell of a lot of them were in Libya. Indeed, come December of 1940, the Italians only had two notable armoured formations. One was the Raggruppamento Maletti, which was split evenly between the M1139s and L335s. The M1139s can perhaps be best considered as the Italian counterpart to the M3 Lee Medium. There is a sudden realisation that both a cannon and a turret are needed courtesy of experience in Ethiopia, but before there was the ability to actually put a cannon into the turret. As the name implies, it's a medium tank, comes in at about 11 tonnes, and accepted for service in 1939. Very logical, really. It's a fairly simple construction, with suspension that looks suspiciously like that of the Vicar 6 tonne. Uh, the vehicle is made of armour plate bolted to a steel frame. Three centimetres of armour isn't going to stop much beyond the light cannon, but it was actually pretty typical at the time. The 105 horsepower diesel wasn't going to set speed records, but it was serviceable enough. The primary armament was of two 8mm machine guns, operated by the commander in the one-man turret off to the side. This of course meant that the commander suffered from the same problems of any other one-man turret tank. He can fight his tank, he can load and shoot the weapons, or he can communicate with the outside world. Doing all three at once is a little bit too much to be expected, especially since communication was purely visual, they had no radios. He also had a very good chance of getting hit by the recoil of the cannon, if he wasn't careful. The cannon was an older 37mm, semi-automatic, and very similar to that found on the Fiat 3000, the Italian version of the Fiat FT. Indeed, some were taken from the Fiat's due to production lag. Not a fantastic tank fighter, but the cannon would still do a number on the light tanks which formed a sizable chunk of Britain's tank force, and it was a danger to the cruisers. The gunner, who had to be careful not to be hit by a rotating turret, was cramped, and also had to load the gun. And finally there was a driver, though at least the Italians had by then generally figured out driver's positions. The other vehicle available, as mentioned, was the L335. All of three tons in weight, a two-man crew and twin machine guns, the vehicle is tiny, which is likely its one redeeming feature. It could be fairly hard to hit. Now, when facing an enemy which isn't well equipped with anti-tank weapons, in open terrain an armoured mobile machine gun pillbox is still quite a threat to infantry, but there are quite a few boys ATRs and two-pounders out there to face them. The Italians had long concluded that they were obsolete, but they just didn't have anything better in the field. The Maletti group had a very short career after the British counterattack started. Caught off guard in camp at uh, Nibewa, they received the attentions of four dozen Matilda II's and were wiped out. The termination will only go so far when your opponent has three inches of armour. The only other Italian armoured force at the time was Brigata Corazzata Speciale which was a proper combined arms unit and had some 60 of the new M1340s. This tank is generally given scathing reviews because the Italians faced Shermans and Churchills in it. And indeed it wasn't the best tank in the world in 1940 either, but by the standards of 1940 it was quite serviceable. 
So you basically take the lower hull from the M1139, replace the upper hull with a design which incorporates a turret and a cannon. Again, shades of M3 and M4 medium here. Add more armor, now 4 centimeters. This increases the weight to 13 tons. Put a new, more powerful V8 diesel engine into it, so 30 kilometers an hour is feasible. The turret is now a two-man one, which, though far from ideal, vastly reduces the workload of the commander. And best of all, it comes with a 47mm cannon, which was possibly the best tank gun in the world in the early 1940, definitely competing with the French and Soviet offerings. Well capable of engaging the British cruisers, it also had a high explosive round on issue. Not the biggest bang in the world, but definitely better than the nothing that their opponents came equipped with. Coaxial to that was one of the 8mm machine guns. A bow gunner fired another twin 8mm, and next to him was the driver. The Special Brigade was basically wiped out at Beta Form after a very hard pressed battle. The Arietta Armored Division would then be thrown into the fray by February 41, also equipped with M1340s and L335s, but with a lot fewer vehicles than they were supposed to have. They would prove to perform well enough until they hit an Australian roadblock at Tobruk, being all but wiped out. The Aussies, well, they were equipped with Italian tanks. The Italians also put into service an armoured car, the Otto Blinda AB41, developed from the previous low-volume AB40. This all-wheel drive, all-wheel steering armoured car complete with a rear-facing driver had an engine as good as the tanks, making it extremely capable of fast off-road operations. Better yet, for reconnaissance, every vehicle had a radio. The turret was lifted from the L6 light tank with a 2cm Breda cannon. Sadly, it was a one-man turret, but capable of going through 3cm of armor, it was plenty dangerous enough to any enemy recon units it might happen to encounter. By this point, the Germans have also entered the fray, and they brought along the 5th Light Division, which was something of an ad hoc formation. As with the invasion of France before it, the main tank of the German forces was the Panzer III. By this point, the standard variant is the G model, most of which had been built with a 5cm 42. Those which had been built with the 37mm had been slated for upgunning. Now, I've been quite upfront about my praise for Panzer III, and by early 1941, it was still, I submit, the best tank in the world. And no, I've not forgotten about the Soviet Union. It still had the three-man turret crew, radios, and now the 5cm gun would destroy anything short of a Matilda II with typical ranges. The 10-speed pre-selected gearbox had had its teething bugs worked out, and the tank was one step shy of bulletproof and reliability, which was just as well, given how hard it was to pull out the transmission. With 3 centimeters of armor, the tank was not invulnerable, but when well handled, remained a very dangerous opponent. Supporting them, the Panzer IV. These would have been D and E models. The differences were in detail. Though the E was supposed to be built with 5 cm of armor as a result of experience in Poland, in the end they retained the same 3 cm of the earlier variant. It also retains the short 7.5 cm gun, providing a lovely bang for dealing with soft targets like anti-tank guns at range. Though it did have a reasonable AP round, accuracy at distance was going to be a bit of an issue simply due to low velocity. Otherwise, basically the same tank as seen in France a year prior, although a number did start receiving bolt-on armor. A number of Panzer IIs, mainly B and C models, rounded out the Panzer units, but a few A's were also shipped over in February 41. The main change to these, compared to the types seen in France and Poland, was a modification for engine ventilation and the addition of extra armor. About 2 centimeters worth got bolted onto the front. They were used either in reconnaissance roles or to supplement the Panzer III's. The 2cm cannon would generally need to have been fired at the side of an enemy tank in order to have a chance of penetration, but even if fired from the front would be quite an attention getter. A small amount of F models will have just started arriving, the main difference really just being 3cm of frontal armour to begin with without need for additional bolt-on. A small amount of Panzer I's would have been around as well, but they were withdrawn pretty quickly. We met the related Panzer Jäger one in France, and a battalion showed up with 5th Light. The crews retained high confidence in the gun, but did observe that the only way to reliably deal with Matildas was to pummel the things until internal spawning forced the crew to abandon. An APCR round would not be developed for several months yet. The division was also fairly well equipped with towed 37 and a few 5cm guns. 
Reconnaissance was provided mainly by the same 221 and 222 armored cars, supported by a couple of 231 eight-wheel armored cars. Self-propelled anti-air guns were the SDK FZ 10-4. A few 88s were around as well, and it's probably also worth mentioning the small number of excellent Italian 90mm guns, though by this point they had not yet been mounted onto trucks. You will note that I have not mentioned the Stumgeschutz. There weren't any. Finally, the British. This also will be fairly short, but there is a quirk. You will recall from my video of the development of British doctrine that the Middle East was considered something of the saviour of the British Armoured Force, because it was the only justification that they had to spend money developing equipment and tactics. This meant that the British basically had their best modern division there. First Armoured had been barely stood up in time to get hammered in France, but Egypt was the home to Mobile Force, later changed to Mobile Division Egypt in late 1938. With the change in designation also came a new commander and the British sent one of their best armoured warfare experts to take charge, a Major General Percy Hobart. He promptly set about them and by all accounts trained his division to a very high standard before a personality clash saw him relieve the command just when the war was starting to heat up. The division he left, well that became later the 7th Armoured Division, the Desert Rats. By the time the Desert War got going, Hobart was a Lance Corporal in the Home Guard. Although just last month in the World War II Channel timeline, March 1941, Churchill found him, pulled him out of retirement and gave him 11th Armoured. Very well trained though they may have been, the equipment that they had was a little bit more limited. To put it in perspective, the 6th RTC still had the Vickers medium tanks. 11th Hussars was using a model 1924 Rolls Royce armoured car, although they had changed out the turret to a, an open topped type with a boys machine gun and a smoke mortar together with some Morris CS9s. Both armoured cars performed very well indeed. Tank wise we are still talking about the first and second generations of cruisers which we saw in France. The A9 and 10 with the bright idea suspension were the oldest. A9 was reasonably fast with almost no armour, but with a three-man turret and very capable two-pounder gun, it could still hit hard if well handled. The A10, with up to three centimetres of armour, might, if you were lucky, take a knock or two. It was dangerous to receive the attentions of, but it was painfully slow. Both initially suffered problems with the air filters in the desert, but modifications had been made by the time the fighting started given the practical experience the British encountered in training, and both were considered quite reliable. Cruiser 4 was almost more the same. Similar turret and firepower, but now a new, faster running gear, the Christie suspension. The downsides? Well, the suspension made the interior a little cramped, and the Liberty engine had a tendency to shake itself apart. The Cruiser 3 had a half inch of armor, and Fletcher states that only the 4, with 3 centimeters, was used in the desert. All the cruisers had fragile tracks, which didn't hold together well on rocky ground. However, all in all, the British cruisers were moderately fast, very dangerous, and found to be reasonably reliable. Oh, and they all had radios. I would argue that the cruiser Mark IV was the best tank that the Allies had in the opening part of the war, and they were the backbone of the major British successes at the beginning of the North African campaign. Their only major downfall? The lack of a high explosive round. The jewel was the Queen of the Desert, the infantry tank Mark II, aka the Matilda II. With about three inches of armour, the thing was almost invulnerable to anything the Italians could throw at it, barring the rare 90mm or artillery pieces in direct fire. And to their credit, Italian artillerymen were often very good. But by and large, Matilda went where Matilda wanted. Uh, they had their own reliability issues, the clutch, but the commander of the battalion that had them, the 7th RTR, was paranoid about reliability. He would tow the tank around sharp corners with a truck to save wear on the steering system, which had been identified as a problem in France, and he had a rule of not operating the vehicle at over half speed unless in a fight or in an emergency. This meant that the tank would trundle from battlefield to battlefield at 8 miles an hour, and pauses for rest, maintenance or refueling would reduce that by even more. Given the distances of the desert, one can imagine how this was an operational problem. But the tanks got there. Fortunately, the opposition was at the time mainly Italian, and for the first part of the desert war they were generally not well mechanized, and so the infantry tanks could take their time. 
Making up the numbers were the Mark VI light tanks, seen before in France, though supposedly, at least by one account, there was no ammunition for the 5.0 machine guns. Fairly reliable and fast little things, and like the Italian tankettes, if you're facing them with no anti-armour ability of note, they can be quite dangerous. So that about covers the vehicles. Again, I have to emphasize how early in the war we still are in the realms of technological development, already a third of the way into 1941. We have not yet reached the era of the Mark IV Specials, the Crusaders or the Stuarts, so enamored of World War II enthusiasts. Even two pounders on Porte were not yet a thing. Some Aventes have not yet shown up and anything like a tiger is a sheer fantasy to a soldier at this point. Now we can come back and revisit this theater and its vehicles in a year or so and see how they changed. So till the next time, take care. Thank you.